Hey guys, it's Charlotte and so nice to have you here. This is gonna be my February wrap up and it's a long video, so let's just start. The first book I want to talk about is War and Peace. I started reading in January and it took me about five to six weeks to finish it. And my advice if you want to start reading this book but are a little scared is to just become loosely acquainted with the Napoleonic War era. Like maybe read some Wikipedia articles, that should be enough. And I'm gonna give you a general idea of what this book is about and you know the themes in it and how I annotate this book and hopefully I can convince you to read it. So One Piece is about some big events of history and the small lives that inhabit those events. And in this book, Tolstoy watches his own war against historians, how history traditionally is recorded and the very way we understand history. Because when we study history, we usually only look at the heroes because they seem to be the driving force of historical events. But you see, the higher a person stands on the social ladder and the more power they have, the less directly can they participate in the action. So what directly drives the movement of nations is the activity of the general mass of the people who take part in the event. Morally, it is the wield of power who causes the event, like a general, but physically it is those who submit to the power, like soldiers. So the cause of the event lies neither in the one nor in the other, but the union of the two. And the problem with historians or the way they study historical events is that they ignore the other half that is equally important. They only look at Alexander, they only look at, you know, Napoleon. And that's why Tolstoy doesn't just write an essay to criticize them, but a book, a literary work where fictional characters like peasants, soldiers and aristocrats mix and mingle with historical characters. He rewrites the Napoleonic Wars through the lens of real people. If life could write, it would write like Tolstoy, just like Isaac Babel said. And I also want to read you something from the introduction. The movement of thousands of troops, a line on the page of a history book, will be enlarged by Tolstoy into chapters of soldierly details about books and carriage wheels, horse manure and lac wrappings, the texture of uniform cloth and steamed potatoes pulled from the campfire. It also shows you the connection between history and science. Oh my god, like, Tolstoy so many times uses maths and physics to illustrate the point he makes and the parallels he draws are just kind of mind-blowing to me. Like, you know, when you take an integral, the Riemann integral, you are effectively summing up infinitely many rectangles with infinitesimally small width. And you know, when you compare the process of integration to the writing of a historical event, the count part of those rectangles are real people, not just Alexander, not just Napoleon. You know, people make up history. It's also a book about cause and effect, which eventually leads to Tolstoy's discussions on free will. And again, this is about Tolstoy's beef with the historians. The historians like to assign a cause to an event, but Tolstoy says no, there can be no cause of an event except the one cause of all causes, because everything is so intertwined. You know, an event has to happen because of the chain of things that has happened before it. And similarly, the more power a person has, the less free are they because of what I expected of them, and the more predeterministic are their actions. And even for us normal people, our autonomy is not what we think it is. What we presume to be our free will or free action is actually bounded by so many things that we just won't be able to wear of all of them. And whatever we do, we are to some extent pursuing freedom, especially if you think about what we do for our health, wealth, knowledge, work and leisure. You know, we are all slaves in our pursuit of freedom. It's also a book about death and how one should look at death. I picked up this book mainly because someone very close and very dear to me passed away a few months ago and I just, you know, needed some help and some guidance on this matter. I was just thinking the other day that when we look at a dying person, apart from the sorrow and pain that we feel, we are ultimately sorry for them because they soon won't be alive and because we are living and we all know how great it is to be alive. But after reading One Piece, it just strikes me that how can I be sure that death is inferior to life when I have no idea what death is? No one, absolutely no one alive can know fully what death is. People like morticians and forensic pathologists have seen their dead bodies, but never once have they seen death itself. And death is just something that I will eventually have to experience and go past it. But for now, I don't know what death is. And how can I say it is evil when I only have prejudice against it? And it also seems insulting to the dead to think that I'm in a state superior to theirs. Also, two death scenes in this book, and also Tolstoy's The Death of Ilan Ilyich, made me realize that when I was looking at the dying person, it is I who was suffering, not the person dying. Because, you know, death is 
a form of liberation. And there's something in the book that I just want to read to you. In his words, his tone, and especially in that calm, almost antagonistic look, could be felt an estrangement from everything belonging to this world, terrible in one who is alive. Evidently, only with an effort did he understand anything living, but it was obvious that he failed to understand, not because he lacked the power to do so, but because he understood something else something the living did not and could not understand and which wholly occupied his mind you know maybe death is not what we presume it to be after all just like roga said in this book but you know ultimately this book is about life and hope and finding peace and love it is the knowledge that you know you will die eventually but still try to live your best life anyways is living your best life even possible in the middle of wars and in this book you can see people like andre and pierre having epiphanies in the real wars and finding peace within themselves through suffering violence and death and you know having these things revealed to them only through this extreme lack of peace and we must believe in the possibility of happiness in order to be happy and now i do believe in it let the dead bury their dead but while there's life we must live and be happy one thing that i don't like about one piece is how Tolstoy writes the female characters each time a young female character appears he has to remark about their slender waist their shoulders their long neck their bosom their lips their nose their teeth oh my god i get it like there's a character called natasha she's one of the major characters and at first i quite liked her but then Tulsa just keeps talking about her you know physical appearance i'm like oh my god stop it i just i would like to read more about you know her character not just her physical appearance, if that makes sense. And it reminds me of something Anne Bronte wrote in her first novel, Agnes Grey. And she says, If a woman is fair and amiable, she is praised for both qualities, but especially the former by the bulk of mankind. If, on the other hand, she is disagreeable in person and character, her plainness is commonly inveighed against as her greatest crime, but to common observers, it gives the greatest offence. That's what I'm talking about. Also, we need to acknowledge Tolstoy's wife, Sofia Tolstoya. She famously transcribed Tolstoy's illegible drafts into third copies seven times over. Regarding how I edited the book, um, basically I just underlined stuff I want to underline and then sometimes I wrote in the margin. Okay, these are the tabs that I put. Can you see it? Purple is for free will and history. And then this one is for meaning of life, death, existentialism. Orange is for war and or peace. Green is imagery, um, pink is family, marriage, and love. Then yellow is just my favorites, you know, anything that I like. And this one, this is a skin tab, it's just for religion. It's not a huge thing in this book, so. And then I have this one, which is Tolstoy's jibber jabber because he jabbers a lot. And I have these three, they're just, you know, for characters. This one is for Andre, and this one's for Pierre, and this one's for Nikolai. I just wrote their names in Russian. Okay, so we are done with one piece, and I have a full throat. A few inches later. I just took a very long nap because I went to sleep at 3 in the morning because my favorite Etsy shop got restocked at that time and their products got sold up pretty quickly so I didn't want to miss it. Hence this situation. The first book that I finished last month was The Secret History by Donald Hart and I adored it from the bottom of my heart. I think a sentence that perfectly summarizes this entire book is a quote from The Broken Heart which is actually quoted in this book. Alas, poor gentleman, he looked not like the ruins of his youth, but like the ruins of those ruins. I feel like that's the spirit of this book. I suppose we all know that this is the Dark Academia book and it has inspired the entire aesthetic, but ironically it criticizes, you know, the elitism and classism associated with classical studies. It creates this facade that beguiles you and makes you believe in the illusion only to destroy it later all at once. The way everything crumbles at the end is like witnessing an earthquake at a magnitude of 8.0. So in this book we follow Richard Papen who transfers to the lead Hampton College and he manages to endear himself to the sole classics professor called Julian and he accepts him into his very exclusive Greek class which only has five students Henry, Bunny or Edmund, Francis and twins Charles and Camilla. They are all handpicked by Julian and they form a very cliquish group and everyone except Richard in the class is pretty well off so Richard 
is really insecure about his background and he lies about it all the time in order to fit in. And the story opens with the five students murder of Bonnie. It's basically Richard years later reflecting upon the situation that led up to their murder. And about half the book deals with the murder and another half the psychological effect and repercussions that follow. Anyways, I already did a reading vlog on this one. So I just want to talk about my favorite character, Henry Winter, and there won't be any spoilers. So Henry is an interesting character. He is completely indifferent to other people's feelings and his actions are solely driven by aesthetics. Everything he does follows that one maxim, that of aestheticism. Other than that, he is completely oblivious because he doesn't care to understand anything not aligning with his worldview. For him to commit the murder is to fulfill a higher purpose, so he isn't really perturbed by the death of Bunny. He is incapable of realizing that it is actually an evil thing because to him it couldn't have been evil. He is pursuing his ideal and what is right in his mind must also be just. So that's why I think it's impossible to say if he is a good or bad person because what he pursues, aestheticism or beauty, is an amoral thing. And in the picture of Dorian Gray, in the preface, there's a paragraph that says, no artist has ethical sympathies, and ethical sympathy in an artist is an unpardonable mannerism of style, and Henry embodies this. And the problem with Henry's obsession with beauty is that, and I quote, beauty, unless she's wet to something more meaningful, is always superficial. What's wrong with what Henry does is that he chooses to ignore others equally as important, for example, morality and ethical judgment. And pursuing aestheticism has the potential to do good, and that's why he saves Richard, but at its core, it's completely contrary to human nature. We depend on our morality for our decision making. And you can see throughout the entire book, Richard greatly admires Henry, although he doesn't know that Henry actually manipulates him to achieve his aim. And I just feel like Richard, when recounting their past, is still under Henry's spell and thinks that he is heroic. So, you know, if I could read this book from the perspective of another character, it would be Bonnie. Because I feel like Richard tries to make their murder sound justifiable by making Bonnie a worse person than he actually is. Anyways, that's The Secret History. And let me know your thoughts on this book if you've read it. And then I read Dracula, you know, vampires, Victorian horror, gothic novel, we all know that. This is about basically a bunch of people hunting down a vampire. It's entirely epistolary. It starts with Jonathan Harker's journals about his imprisonment in Dracula's castle. And then it moves on to his fiance, Mina's correspondence with her friend. And then it moves on to Dr. Seward's journals, etc, etc. And you can see how these characters connect the dots in their letters and journals and how their storylines gradually converge and how they find out about the vampire. And the first half of this book is really like captivating, suspenseful, creepy and quite erotic I have to say. And there's a lot of you know quintessential vampiric characteristics that are originated from this book. Like they can't be seen in mirrors, they can turn into bats and they avoid sunlight. Basically everything up to where Lucy's plotline ends I was really into it but then the story just drags on and it gets so repetitive and the ending I thought it was you know very anticlimactic so I ended up giving it three and a half stars. Actually I read some papers on this book, just two or three papers and you know sexuality is one of the biggest themes of this book and there's also some you know homosexual suggestions which I didn't realize at all until I read those papers but basically Bram Stoker and Oscar Wilde were acquainted I don't know if they were friends, but I know that, I, I think I read it somewhere that their families were part of the same social circle and Stoker had planned to write Dracula for a long time, but it wasn't until August 1895 that he began writing it. And that was three months after Oscar's imprisonment for indecency. So one theory is that Dracula is the debased incarnation of the fallen wild and he represents the ghoulishly inflated version of wild produced by wilds prosecutors, the corrupting, evil, secretive, manipulative, magnetic devourer of innocent boys. I'm gonna put the name of the paper down below. The homosexual suggestion is most obvious at the beginning, especially when, you know, one of Dracula's wives is about to suck Jonathan's blood and Dracula bursts in and exclaims, this man belongs to me. So yeah, that's Dracula. 
and then I read The Bell Job by Sophie Plath, which is an early novel. And in this book, we follow Esther Greenwood as she descends into mental illness after her internship in New York City. And Esther experiences her internship, her depression, parallel Plath's own life. And this book was definitely hard for me to read because I also had depression. Some part of it was just a bit triggering for me. But overall, I'm quite glad that I finished it because it gives voice to my dark and bizarre thoughts that I couldn't have said when I was depressed because I knew they would creep people out. And those thoughts really drove me crazy and sometimes I had to call lifeline in the middle of the night just, you know, to ask for help. And so, you know, some part of this book really hits home. And Plath herself even wrote about the book that I think it will show how isolated a person feels when he's suffering a breakdown. And the title of the book, The Bell Jar, is a metaphor for how Esther or Plath herself feels during her depressive episode. She feels that she is trapped inside a bell jar and supplicated. The story has an open ending and we don't know if Esther's condition has truly improved and if she's going to return to university. And given the mental state Plath was in when she finished writing the book, I think it makes sense. She couldn't have written a different ending because she was trapped in her own bell jar. And the real tragedy is that she had never managed to escape it. She committed suicide. I just don't want to sound too depressing and you know I really like this book apart from some casual racist remarks I gave it 4 out of 5 and then I read The Outsider or The Stranger depending on the translation by Albert Camus and this is another depressing book oh my god I gave it 4 stars and the story um, takes place in French Algeria the main character is a guy who treats everything with cold indifference and detachment. At the beginning of the story, his mom died, but he doesn't bother finding out when, and he doesn't even know how old his mom is, and he, you know, all he can think about is, you know, how hot it is and his sleepiness. At work, when he's offered an opportunity to work in Paris and his boss asks him if he's excited about it, he replies, you can never really change your life and in any case, every life is more or less the same. And he also has a girlfriend, but each time he sees her, he just sees a pair of boobs. And later, he kills a person and in his defense, it's because the sun was in his eye and the sweat also got into his eyes and it was unbearable, so he pulled the trigger. This is a really ambiguous story, but the ex Execution is amazing. It has a lot of lyrical paragraphs about nature, especially the sun and the sea imagery. And the main character's thought process is kind of like the calm waves. He is very tranquil. And the way Camus portrays the main character is entirely neutral. You just can't say he is an evil and cruel person, but his lack of emotion and what he does do cause misunderstandings and they do hurt people. It makes me wonder what happened to him, why he behaves like this. Was he born like this? We see his story in its end game. But there are no mentions as to why he's so detached. There must be a reason why he behaves like this, and when we find out that reason, he may not be that repugnant after all. It just reminds me of something in One Piece, the bit where Tolstoy talks about um, free will. If we have a large range of examples, if our observation is constantly directed to seeking the correlation of cause and effect in people's actions, their actions appear to us more under compulsion and less free, the more correctly we connect the effects with their causes. And the main character keeps saying very nihilistic things like, everyone knows life isn't worth living, since we're all going to die, it is obvious that when and how don't matter. So as far as the meaning of life is concerned, this book doesn't really tell you anything, you know, whether life turns out one way or the other, whether someone does something or doesn't, it doesn't matter. It all ends the same. I don't know if I agree with that, but that's okay. And you know, it's a book like this that makes me want to learn French. The outsider remind me of two books, Metamorphosis and No Longer Human. I read this one last month and No Longer Human, I read it too many times. I think I should really make a video just dedicated to the author or this book because this book is considered Dazai Wasami's um, autobiography and his suicide note. I'll think about it. Next I read Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. I really like the cover and yeah I just bought this one because of its cover but I don't recommend you getting this one because there's so many mistakes with the punctuations and a few typos and given the price I was expecting a high quality. I gave this one three and a half stars because I expect greater things from Kafka's letters to his father and the trial. In this edition there are um, three three stories, Metamorphosis, In the Pentacle and The Judgment, A Story for F. So we all know what Metamorphosis is about, just you know a man wakes up one morning and finds himself turned into a gigantic cockroach and you know it's a story about how he is 
gradually forgotten by his family. And then um, in the panel, Colony is about, you know, this visitor who is invited to a colony, an unnamed colony, and, you know, to attend the execution of a soldier. And the execution officer presents to him with great enthusiasm a torture and execution machine. Basically, it just, you know, it, it carves the sting of the person on their skin for 12 hours non-stop. But the story in the middle just takes an unexpected turn, which I won't tell. And the judgment is about a man who is sentenced to death by drowning by his own father, which I suppose Kafka took inspiration from his own relationship with his father. The three stories are kind of similar in the sense that they are all told by an omniscient narrator, very detached from the events that one would, you know, normally expect it to be registered with horror and absurdity. And the victims in the stories are so helpless that they simply resign themselves to what befalls them and I think it's supposed to show that how powerless people are in the grand scheme of things. You know, misfortune may befall us at any moment and no matter how hard we work, how much love we have, we can be struck down at any moment. We just perish when forced into some bizarre scenario. There's no hope, there's no justice, such is life. Oh god, look what the books I read did to me. This is how a person is like after reading The Bell Jar, The Outsider and Metamorphosis back to back. Please don't do what I did to myself, to yourself. The last book that I read is Everything I Know About Love by Dolly Alderton. This is her memoir and I give it three stars. Please don't come at me, I know how many people love this book but it just it didn't work for me and I'll explain why in a second. This is, you know, for me just a palate cleanser after reading a bunch of depressing books. I need something just, you know, light. And it's about everything she has learned about love from her long-term female friendships. It deals with her alcoholism, struggles with her romantic relationships, too much dating, too much casual sex, her existential crisis, and her fear of turning 30. You know, in terms of personality, I am the exact opposite of the author. I'm an IFJ, by the way, and, you know, growing up, I I was just practically mute all the time because I was really shy. I'm less shy, but still I won't go to bars or go clubbing because I just don't feel comfortable being surrounded by strangers. And I would say most of the time I am fine with and fond of my own company. So that's why I think many things in this book doesn't, you know, apply to me. So that's why I gave it three stars. But yeah, that's pretty much this book. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching and happy reading. I'll see you soon.